Okay, I'm going to tell you a, a story. And we're going, to talk, we're going to talk about what's under your feet. We're going to talk about wood. We're going to talk about where it comes from. We're going to talk about how amazing it is. So three trees grew in the backyard of the home that I grew up in. They were transplanted there by my parents. They were arranged in no particular order, though I would later learn that they were planted close enough to the house in order to shade an imagined future deck. <laughs> now, the other thing about these trees is that they looked alien. If I were to look left across into my neighbor's yard and scan across to my other neighbor's yard, what I could see was the role, the still perceivable role, of farmland that had been recently studded with split-level houses, one of which I was growing up in, and these three trees just sitting there in the middle of this, these acre and a half lots. My relationship to these trees was not an easy one. I could not climb them. It wasn't allowed. I could not build a tree house in them. It wasn't allowed. There was no creative tension I could sort of project onto these trees. They had achieved a protected status. My parents enforced this protected status on these trees, which is why the next thing I'm going to tell you was particularly confusing for me as a 10-year-old. In order to heat part of our house, we burned wood. So one uh, fall, late fall, my uh, dad announced on a Saturday morning that we were going to, my sister and I were going to get in the truck and we were going to go and help load logs into the back of the truck. And we're thinking, well, where are we going and what are we going to be doing? And it turns out we were going to be driving onto a site where all the timber all the trees were being felled, they were being harvested, and we were going to take some of those trunks, and I watched the trees fall, and I watched the trunks get sliced, and I helped load those logs into the truck, we carted them home, we split the logs, and we stacked them into cords of, lum uh, uh, cords of wood to be used for fuel to heat our house. But perhaps the greatest mystery of all was the pile of two by fours. The pile of two by fours next to the cord of wood. The pile of two by fours that seemed to increase and decrease because my dad was, was bringing them from construction sites, from his construction sites, and sort of dumping them into the carport. And my sister and I found ourselves having to manage not only the logs, but also having to manage this pile of two by fours and keep them both equally neat. That's what we had to do. And I have to confess that at that time, I didn't understand that the two by four came from the tree, that they were in fact related, that they, they had an intimate relationship to each other because the two by four seemed so very different from the piece of, the piece of felled, wood that was going to keep my house. And I also have to confess that I didn't understand at the time that the two by four was assembled one adjacent to the other in the split level house, holding up the roof that was over my head and transferring its load down to the foundation of our house. The two by four was all around. So as an architect, as someone who operates in the built environment, I now start with the two by four. It's a unit of material that I can operate with, but I persist in asking, why do we think of it as something that's just simple? Why do we cast it as something that's sort of inert, that's ineffective? The two by four, we're going to see, is incredibly complex. Now, if you were to measure a two by four, <laughs> if you were to take out 
your tape measure. Well, yes, it's true. It's not two inches by four inches. It's one and a half inches by three and a half inches. But in that discrepancy of inches lies the real mystery. It is. It's, it's pretty awesome. And it's true that the two by four does come from the tree. It comes from the trunk of the tree. And the tree is relational in the forest, one tree next to the other tree next to the other. And depending how close one tree is to another tree, and it, 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 it can cause the trees to get more water, more sunlight, less water, less sunlight. So the tree is likewise relational one to the other. Oh, now it's working too good. OK. <laughs> And the amount of water and the amount of sunlight that that tree has is dependent on its region, on where it grows, on how much sun is available, on how much water is available, on where it's growing in terms of its elevation. It's dependent on its geology, its soil. And we've all peered into the trunk of a tree. And perhaps when we've, we've stood over the stump of a tree and we've sort of looked at these concentric rings and perhaps meditated a little bit, we, look, we, we can begin to project down into the ground and think about the things that we can't see, the root system. But certainly what we know we can see, and I would submit that all of us here could collectively draw this and begin to identify all the parts of this tree. What we began to see in this very center, which is called the pith, in that very center are the cells from the original sapling. And at the very edge is the bark, the dead cells. And right underneath that is a layer of active cells. And so the tree is growing from the center outward. But we also see a differentiation in color. We know that when we look into that stump, we know that there's sort of a darker color at the center and a lighter color to the outside. And that's simply, over time, the cells begin to become inactive and cause that, that darkening of color in the center. And the cells towards the, end that, towards the edge that are the lighter color are active. They're transporting nutrients to that tree. But we also know something else. We know those lines mean something that those lines, in fact, are growth lines, that those lines are a record of how the tree has an interacted with its environment. And if we were to zoom into those lines, what we begin to see is individual cells. And in the light area, we see cell growth very rapidly. And this is in the spring when there is abundant water and we have this sort of very fast growth. But then as resources become sparse, we have denser cell growth, smaller cell growth. So when you look at the rings of the tree, that's all cells. It's just that some are packed closer together than others, which is why we can count the years of the tree. And if we zoom into an individual cell, we know that here we have a complex arrangement, a connection, a connecting together of one fiber, one hollow fiber to another, one hollow cellulose and hemicellulose fiber to another, connected together by lignin. It's an incredible composite. And if we look at the individual cell yet again, what we see is, is a, the, the cell wall is in fact comprised of four layers. And it's comprised of microfibrils. And in those four layers, they're at different orientations. So they're actually uh, stronger next to each other. This is an amazing composite. And so we see that the structure of the tree is dependent on all of these scales interrelated to each other, which is why when we want to extract the two by four from the tree, we have to make plans. And we make plans and we rationalize how to actually cut this rectangular, very long rectangular object from something that's irregular, from something that interacts with what could be called a dynamic milieu, its environment. And we know that how we cut it matters because that results in a grain pattern. And we've all seen incredibly beautiful grain patterns. 
But when we cut it, something begins to happen in that cell. In that cell, the water that would have existed in the hollow space begins to evaporate. And once it's gone, the water that exists in the cell wall begins to evaporate. And the cellulose, the hemicellulose, and the lignin all get closer and closer together. And that's what makes the two by four. Whoops. That's what makes the two by four. It's that the two by four is very different from the tree because there's no water. Therefore, when the, the water is gone and evaporated, I have something that's stronger. I have a unit of material that's lighter. I have a unit of material that's more dense. I have a unit of material that can, in fact, transfer the kinds of loads that need to be transferred from a roof to a foundation. The two by four is no longer the tree. really working out. Okay. But there's one other thing. A tree sequesters carbon. So the tree, as it is growing, forms cellulose, for, forms cells out of cellulose. And the tree does this through photosynthesis, through the conversion of carbon dioxide and water to cellulose. So as the tree is growing, we can imagine that it's, it's sequestering more and more carbon as it's get, growing in diameter outwards. It's sequestering more and more and more carbon. And at some point, the amount of carbon it sequesters is going to level off. And at some point, a fire might happen and that, that entire uh, stand of trees, all of the carbon that was sequestered could in fact be lost. It's dissipated. When we harvest timber, matters because we can in fact sequester carbon. The forest is a carbon sink. So when we harvest the timber for the two by four, we can say that the two by four is in fact sequestered carbon. And it is related, it, it, it is related once again to this incredible structure, both at this, the cellular scale and at the regional scale. So, is the two by four simple? No, the two by four is not simple. I persist and in, in some time, well, I persist in redefining the relationship between the tree and the log and the two by four. I'm also prone to thinking of material as simple because of the complexity of buildings. A building is the foundation, it is a foundational unit of civilization. It's relational, one building to another to another. It organizes the flow of goods and services. It consumes resources. It is coded to protect your health, your safety, and your welfare. But the building also has meaning. It has cultural meaning. And the building is assembled to create beauty. The building is complex. The two by four is complex. All materials are equally complex. And all materials are emerging. The two by four, well, all materials are emerging. And we can talk about emerging material technologies. And we know that we're thinking about new functions for materials. You've all heard of materials that are self-healing, self-assembling, self-cleaning, cleaning, materials that have shape memory. That doesn't sound like the two by four, but the two by four is equally being scrutinized. All lignocellulosics are equally being scrutinized for new functionality. At, at the cellular scale, we are looking at and still attempting to characterize new applications for cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. 
at the harvesting scale, we are still attempting to harvest trees in such a way that we can capture all of that value about valuable cellulose and lignin, and we can put it to use in new products, in engineered products. And at the forest scale, we are continuing to understand what it means to cumulatively sequester carbon. So the two by four is an emerging material, along with the brick, along with the concrete masonry unit, along with all those time-honored materials that you may be familiar with, right alongside all of those new materials that you're familiar with. So why does, a par there's a paradigm that exists that says, from me to you. Without any knowledge of any of these scales below, there's a paradigm that exists that says, from the two by four, the two by four goes into the building. But we have to remember that problems are being identified and solved at all scales. That design is happening at all scales. And that we, in fact, have an opportunity right here, right now, to begin a new design process, a transcalar design process that allows us to rethink how a building might be delivered by thinking about a building that is solved not only by the architect, by the structural engineer, by the civil engineer, but is likewise solved by everyone in their knowledge operating at all, all of these scales. It's solved by the chemical engineer. It's solved by the material scientist. It's solved by the industrial ecologist. In other words, what we need is a transcalar design process, one where the partitioning of knowledge and vision doesn't only happen in our individual, in, in our individual domains, but one where we recognize the overlaps that exist between these scales, and we can solve the real problems that exist in the relational building and the relational built environment across scales. Thank you.